Hey everybody, good afternoon and welcome to Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly, a podcast for and by business owners who are interested in sharing their go-to tools and strategies to help other businesses grow strong and soar higher. Today we are talking with Allison Donahue, and I have got an absolutely incredible bio that I'm going to read to you. Normally, it's, it's a little bit shorter than this one, <laughs> but I love every word on this. So hang tight, guys, and listen with me, because this is what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the road to becoming a cause and effect strategist was paved by Allison at an early age. As with many roads, the course wasn't straight and true, but rather filled with curves, detours, and unexpected potholes. But as she would discover, the road traveled still delivers. And today, Allison Donahue helps others through her domino effect decision matrix, a unique way to suspend one's belief, consider the opposite, and proceed with perspective. As a single mother at the age of 20, Allison realized that the minimal number of jobs she was qualified were were never going to put food on the table, and thus she found the reserve to put herself through university by working three part-time jobs. She set her sights on a degree in criminology with the understanding that sacrificing time with her young son now would hopefully pay dividends down the road for both of them. It was while studying criminology that she began to notice her unique perspectives and viewpoints on the world and how she saw things in a different light. This enhanced way of thinking caused her to switch to social work, but again, the rigid thought process of the industry didn't seem to gel with her perspective. This roadblock was enhanced by the chance meeting of a man who told her she could make a lot more money and spend more time with her son while in the painting business. She left school, began a relationship with this man, and learned the art of painting. Unfortunately, right after moving in together, her boyfriend had a drug relapse and the ugliness of addiction resurfaced, culminating in his death. Struggling to figure out her next move and rid herself of credit card debt caused by her ex's addiction, she threw caution to the wind and started her own painting company, Sunshine Girls Painting. Within a few months, Allison and her son were completely off welfare and the business was booming. Being able to communicate and understand her clients' needs and empower her staff was the key to success. Things progressed, and the very next year, she returned to university and finished her degree in one year. She completed with a Bachelor of Arts and a double minor in psychology and sociology. We have the same degrees. <laughs> As the recession hit, Allison was forced to tighten the screws of business to survive, and this is where she really began to learn about business. How critical thinking is the key to every situation, and an understanding of her ability really began to surface. Being asked to speak at an event, she realized she had something other than painting to offer the people and business owners of the world. The ability to look at a yeah, situation oh <laughs> and anticipate potential outcomes. This was the seed that led to Allison creating Domino Thinking. She wrote an international best-selling book called Think Opposite, using the domino effect to change your business and change the world. Today, Allison speaks to entrepreneurs, small business owners, and coaches about the power of critical thinking. She believes in unexplained perspective and unexamined law and unexamined government business life relationship are all deadly viruses. And the domino effect decision matrix is the vaccine with which to make the world a better place. Her outreach continues with a live online radio show called The Allison Donahue Show, where weekly guests challenge the views of its listeners and other different perspectives. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> if 
anybody's still awake. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, actually, I think that was the most perfect description and says so much about <laughs> all of us. We all have, you and I were just talking about all of my things that are going on in my life that have caused issues and you know we're all struggling we're all figuring things out we all have so much going on in our lives that some of these people that tell you oh it's easy peasy to own your own business you know you can run a successful business in four hours a week that's all garbage <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> unless you're tim ferris yeah yeah <laughs> you know and so i wanted to really highlight all of this because we all can relate in one way or another and that's a perfect way to start out this conversation <laughs> is by hearing these things and i think it's so funny because i've got degrees in criminology i have degrees in sociology i have degrees in psychology <laughs> uh, what was your favorite um well i love my sociology was actually studying middle eastern affairs so i love international i love all of the the and and i turn it into actually um, how to help international people begin businesses either in the United States or take US technology and start businesses in their own countries mm. you know, so I, I've done a lot of that the criminology I've not had I don't have a degree in but my husband is into all of that so when we were living in um virginia we both got our licenses as, as private investigators we were both bodyguards and bounty hunters and you know and now he runs a security agency where we actually help people that are going abroad get ideas on where they're going and where's the best place to stay and don't go into that area of the city because it's dangerous you know all that kind of stuff and i love it it's fascinating <laughs> yeah it would be because well i'm one of those people that wander into the bad neighborhoods inevitably so i do too yeah. but you know it's, at least i know where i'm going experiences in those you know ghetto environments or whatever you want to call them um because i i really people are lovely everywhere Yep, they really are. And, yeah. you know, there's nothing better than learning about somebody else's culture, learning about their foods. You know, it's just, mm. I was married for 25 years to an Iranian, you know, so I, I, I love all of the, we go into a big city just so that we can find foreign restaurants to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially when they stay true, they don't try to westernize their menu too much. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, now that we know a little bit more about Allison, <laughs> let's jump into business. <laughs> yes, let's. <laughs> and I think I, the first question I'm going to ask you is, why do you love business? Oh, gosh, there are so many good answers to that one. Um, mostly because it puts all of the responsibility of my life in my hands right i get to say when i work um when i don't work which is like usually all the time i'm working but i like working and so for me it's a choice and when something gets um uh, more automated i create another business and then that becomes more automated i create another business so i'm a serial entrepreneur and and I love it, but I never would have been able to have this life um, from what I had before. Like I had been on welfare, like all the stats indicated I should have probably spent my life in a low income bracket. Uh, it was my parents were on welfare when I was in high school because of the recession. They couldn't find work because we'd moved to a new city. They had no connections. Uh, so we were on welfare when I was in high school. I got pregnant when I was 19. I had my son the day after I turned 20. So I was still a really young mom, uh, which is, puts us at a disadvantage, yeah. statistically speaking. 
again, it's what we buy into, what we accept as a truth. I refuse to accept that as a truth. And uh, so I was getting minimum wage jobs and I was never going to get further ahead. And it was starting business that allowed me to create this really incredible life that I have. I get to travel a lot. My son is taking over my company. I get to start other companies. Like there is, I get to impact the world the way I want to impact the world, not the way somebody else is telling me how to do things. And the autonomy is huge for me. So, and I could probably go on for days about how fantastic business is. Yet, it is not for everybody. And I think it's really important because I've had staff who have gone out on their own and I've helped them start their own business and then they come back and they're like, I want to just be an employee. Like yeah. owning a business isn't for me. And it's fantastic because I think it's important that we explore things so that we learn our own personal truths. Um, but I, I love that I have employees and that they're not all business owners. Uh, but so it's not for everybody. And I think there's a lot of shaming that goes on a lot around that. Unfortunately, that this ultimate goal is to own your own business. Well, it's, it should only be your goal if you actually want it. Mm -hmm. How does one know, you know, they, they may come from an entrepreneurial family. I know I did. But both of my, both my mom and dad had full-time jobs, but they also had their own businesses on the side. Yeah. You know? And from the minute I can remember, I've had my own business in some way or another. There was just, they didn't push me into it. It just was the only thing I ever thought about. Mm -hmm. But for many years, even though I had a very successful business in the Washington, D.C. area, I ran it as a job. I was the boss of my job. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times people will go into business saying, I've made widgets for 30 years. I know everything there is to know about making a widget. I'm going to be a very successful business. And then everything just stagnates. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the truth. And well, that's what happened with me. When I started my company, that first year, I got off welfare within a few months because it's not that hard to get to make more money than you make on welfare. Uh, because I don't know what it's like down there, but in Canada, it wasn't much. I think I was getting with a single, a single mom, one child, I think I was getting maybe $800 a month. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about how much do you have to work to get off of that? Now, I kept, kept on the system for so long because I could never make enough to pay for all of my daycare costs. So there was always a supplement. So then you're always under their thumb of them telling you how to live and what to do. But when the recession hit, I had thought I was a rock star because my first year I got off welfare, my second year I doubled, my third year I doubled, my fourth year I doubled, and I just kept getting better and better. And then the recession hit and work stopped and I was like, ah, oh, damn, I'm not the rock star I thought I was. Um, I had just been riding the wave of the economy and I was so naive. I didn't know any of that stuff. And it was at that point where I actually really got to dig in and learn about business. So now I can say, yes, it is the economy and it's me. You're a rock star. <laughs> and I'm a rock star. That's right. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, I think that brings up a point too that that's really interesting is there are always ebbs and flows and you can be really high one day and really low the next. Oh, How, that can happen in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. How does someone deal with that from a mindset standpoint? Do they just go, Oh crap, I'm a failure and just stop everything and go back to work for somebody else. Or what did you tell yourself when that was happening? And how did you get yourself through that process? Right. Well, some people do tell themselves that. Some people are just like, screw it, I'm going back to work. And if that's the right choice for you, then that's the right choice for you. But there has to be a difference between knowing that that is running away or it's the right choice for you. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it is running away, you are going to always regret it. So be clear about who you are and what you do. For me... It was always keeping my eye on the end game. Like I don't get married to the process. I get married to the outcome and the outcome is I want to be successful. Mm 
So I am really quick to drop a project, add a project, tweak a project, whatever needs to be done to support that end goal of being successful and making a positive impact in the world. And it is hard. Some days I'm just like, ah, oh, nine to five, Monday to Friday, that would be lovely. If there's even such a thing anymore. Um, <laughs> I don't even know. But although that's not true, my staff work Monday to Friday, eight to four. So yeah, it's a thing. But there are times that I just think it would be so nice to have my evenings alone. But then I think, gosh, if I was doing that, I wouldn't get to take six weeks vacation and go to Cambodia. Um, I wouldn't be able to just a uh, couple a uh, month month and a half ago, I decided to go down to California and do volunteer work in a prison uh, for a long weekend. I wouldn't be able to do that. And so I remind myself when I have those bad days when I just want to throw my hands up in the air and give it all up and, uh, or go postal or whatever I'm feeling at that particular moment and remember that this is giving me the life that I want. And I have so much gratitude for my business, so much. Yeah, yeah. I think gratitude has a lot to do with it too. You have to, you know, you have to appreciate. And we all can't have every day being a good day. You wouldn't want, I wouldn't want that. Mm -mm, How yeah. would I know the difference? How would I know my life was fantastic if I didn't have speed bumps? Yep, absolutely. And my life is fantastic. I want reminders about how fantastic my life is. And I always see those, what could be classified as a negative experience, as a potential positive outcome. So I might be uncomfortable stewing in something right now, a client turns me down or something doesn't go as planned or whatever the case may be. Um, an employee leaves at the last minute and I'm short staffed. Like there's all sorts of problems that go into it. But what I try to remind myself of is this is just the beginning of something great that's coming along. And so I now try to dive in and um, embrace those really tough times so that I can, I get excited because I'm like, there is a silver lining at the bottom of this. So bring on the junk. Let's get through it so that I can see what the silver lining is at the other end. Because, and there's always a silver lining. There always is if you, if you allow yourself to see it. If, yep, yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, I think it also allows you to learn as you're going. I've had people ask me the questions of, if you could do anything in your life over again and change the outcome, what would that be? And I say nothing, because everything that has happened to me, everything that I have done mm -hmm. has led me to where I am today. Yeah, and we don't know what part was the magic part. Right. right. So was it pleasant coming home from the movies when I was 15 years old and seeing my dad dying? No, absolutely not. It was horrible. I still sometimes um, have feelings around it um, because they don't go away. We just get better at coping with it. But what if I could wish that away? poof, with my magic wand, my dad was still alive. I didn't have that experience. What else would have changed going forward? Right. Maybe I never would have had the gumption to get off welfare. Maybe I never would have gotten pregnant and had my amazing son. Like I like to think it all is happening for a reason, even if I don't like what's happening. It's it's kind of like I watch Star Trek. I love Star Trek. I'm a I am a Trekkie. <laughs> they're always talking about don't do anything to disturb the time continuum, you know? Yeah. And, and you but you really stop and think about that. What if you were to go back in time and change something? What would reality today be? Yeah. And you know, you cannot guarantee that it's that it's would be the same as it is. Yeah. And you know, I, I love to learn things. And like, I've been doing this podcasting thing for a year now. And it's been a real struggle for me because I had signed up with a producer who was just bleeding me dry oh, no. and not doing the things she had promised to do and, and putting out the podcasts and the places. And I mean, it was just a nightmare. But through this year, I've learned 
how to do it, how to do it right, how to do it on my own. So mm -hmm. I'm now, you know, hosting it myself. And I just, I was sitting here bawling the other day because I found a new producer who I listened. He did the first one of the podcasts that he's taken over and done for me. And I'm going, oh, my God. Who is this? Whose podcast is this? You know, it was it was incredible, and you'll be able to hear it because he'll be doing yours. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Well, and see, if your first one wasn't absolute crap, you never, you may never have left them if they were just right. mediocre. So while it sucked that they were crappy, thank God they were crappy because you got to fail fast and move on. I love Absolutely. failing fast. Love it, love it. But you know, have you ever seen that show, Timeless? Yes. Right. It's that same thing. They go back in time and it's like, Ooh, we could stop this guy from killing Abraham Lincoln or whatever it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And slavery would be a totally different experience, the race thing in the state. But then they're like, but what else do we change? Yeah. You know, and she comes back at one point and her sister never existed because of something that had happened yeah. or they altered in the past. And yeah. so I really think that life is like that. And I'm so sad that that show, I'm pretty sure that show ended. I'm just like, I love that show. Yeah. I think it was so clever. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's that, uh, it's a really great reminder that it's all a process. We have to understand. And once we, un we don't have to, but once we do understand it, if we let ourselves understand it, it becomes a much easier ride. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking about processes, <laughs> that leads me into my next question. Yes. <laughs> you, you just mentioned that you're not about the processes. You're about the end result. Yeah. But do you think that there needs to be a process in there to get you to that end result? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I say I'm not married to the process, if I'm or process, depending if you're Canadian or American, um, <laughs> American. I, always, I always get nailed on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the important thing is to be willing to let go of a process if it's not working. Mm -hmm right? To be able to say, yes, I need this process. Like right now I'm offering a course called hashtag my part, where we can move from victim state to freedom state by acknowledging how we co-create our life and it boosts our worthiness. And as we become more worthy, we're less likely to fall victim. And so that's launching pretty quick. But within that, it's definitely a process of working through it. I have no problem going that is not clear for people. I'm getting rid of it and throwing something else in to make the process better because I am married to the end result, not this process. This process, I can always keep fixing and tweaking and changing, modifying, throwing out, uh, bringing in, whatever the case may be. There's flexibility there provided it's serving my end goal. And, and I think sometimes it's really hard for people to understand their end goal. Like when I'm working with business owners, that's one of the first things I attach myself to trying to understand is why are you doing what you're doing? So many times we rush into a business and it's always like, what's my client's pain point and how can I address that? I like to back it up. What is your pain point and how does your business support that? Perfect. Right. That's beautiful. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I do an exercise with people. Do you want me to share it? Do we have time for that? Absolutely. Please. Okay. So I call it, what's the worst. <laughs> and so imagine that you were sitting in a restaurant and you overhear somebody talking about you and your business. What is the worst thing that you could hear them say? Now, if somebody said to me, to me about my painting company. Yeah, that Allison, she's not the best painter in town. I'd be like, ouch, that wasn't very nice. But maybe it's true. Um, okay. If they had said she doesn't give value, I would be devastated. I would have to go over there and say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm Allison. How do I fix this? Mm -hmm. Right? It would, it would crush me. And so every, I know because of that, everything in my business has to be set around providing value. So I educate clients whenever I can. I give really clear and concise communication. I give them choices uh, so that at the end of it all, they actually feel like they've gone through this growth journey. So even though it's just house painting, right? It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I want people at the end of it to feel like I was better for that experience. 
and I feel good about signing a check at the end of it and whatever, whatever that looks like. Uh, for some people, like I worked with a woman one time and she said, she's all, if somebody, she overheard somebody saying she was over the top. Like she was just too much. Yeah. And so she said, but I, so I'm always feeling like in my business, I have to tone it down and be careful and cautious. And so I said to her, well, what if you embrace that? What if you just become all that? Mm -hmm. And so when you hear somebody say it, you go over and you say, thank you. I am all that. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's about embracing that. And sometimes it's about creating strategies to avoid something. But if you don't look at why you're in business, why you're doing what you do, you can't run that theme through your business. Then you're not passing that message to your customers. You're not passing it to your staff. You're not passing it to your community. Yeah. Well, and I think when we're talking about things like that, we're talking about ideal clients. If you aren't yourself, in your business, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be giving the best of yourself to your clients. You have to be who you are. Yeah, for sure. Like if my clients say to me, I don't want a breakdown of all the rooms. I just want a price. I'm like, yeah, sorry. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. And they say, what? Like you don't have to go through all that work. And I'm like, actually, yes, I do. If you don't want to go with me, that's totally fine. But I am not compromising the way I do something for all of the reasons I do it because you want me to take a shortcut. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I stand very true. And some people are like, oh my God, you're too much work. I don't want, great, dodged a bullet. Yeah. Like yeah. whenever somebody says no to me, I'm like, thank you. Because now well, I can it focus on. Um, yeah, yeah. It took me a long time to get to that point. And I still, every once in a while, oh, I lost somebody on my Facebook group today. What did I do wrong? I don't care. You, know? <laughs> you, you get to the point where it's, they're not right for you. And I don't have the energy to yeah. waste on trying to please somebody who I'm not going to be able to please because they don't want what I have to offer. You know? Yeah. Well, and that's such a normal um, reaction that people have when they're starting their business that they just have to accommodate everybody. And, and that was mine too. I had to put food on the table. I had to say yes to anybody who wanted a paint mm -hmm. job. Then mm -hmm. I realized that some of those people I should have said no to because they were sucking so much energy. Yeah. I couldn't take care of my people, like yeah. the ones that were my fans. And so I just got to the place where I said no. And honestly, some people get really hostile when you say no. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know yeah. it, I know it. But then you dodged a bullet. Evidence right from the get-go, this person was going to be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, but it is hard. It's hard when you're starting out and you want the money, you need to pay your bills, you need to pay your staff, whatever the case may be, to say no. And you have to do it a few times. But now when I say no, I'm like, yes, I'm so glad I said no. Like it's a celebration for me now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, at first, I think you want, for me, it was, and I've been doing this for a long time, but, you know, you want, you want everybody to like you, you want everyone to think that you're, you know, you're the right person for them, that they're going to be your client and all this. And I was thinking about this the other day because for a long time people were telling me, some people were telling me, oh, you can't use flying pigs. Those aren't, you know, those aren't professional and, and all this. And I, and I would walk around at business meetings and I would be all dressed up with my fancy clothes and my high heeled shoes and, you know, just trying to be this. Well, keep in mind I was in Washington DC with all the congressmen and you know senators and all that so I had to be just so that's not me I'm barefoot I'm you know I I'm I'm wearing if I'm not wearing blue jeans I'm wearing the gypsy skirts and you know um my friends tell me I should have been a clown or I should be a, you know, a comedian because I like to laugh. I like to make other people laugh. And, mm -hmm. and if you walk around just being, you know, this straight laced person, I was miserable mm -hmm. and I could not do what I wanted for my clients. And yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a hard story to get through to people. It is. And when you know, when you think about it, when you're, when you're lying on your deathbed, you can look back over your life and say, I was miserable, but I did everything everybody else wanted me to do. 
And honestly, none of those people give a crap that you're on your deathbed. Yeah. They don't. And the only person that truly cares is you <laughs> and those handful of people that are really close to you. Right. And mm -hmm. if we're fortunate enough to have a handful of people at the end that mm -hmm. are, are, are with us and uh, caring for us. Uh, so you get to decide how you live your life. And I measure everything by how am I going to judge this on my deathbed? Am I going to regret this? Am I going to be disappointed in myself? You know, if I let myself down, have I let those I love down? And that's how I measure everything. And it makes it so much easier to stay on track. So if I'm given option A or B, I look at both of them and I'm like, deathbed good, deathbed bad. Let's go with this one, right? <laughs> uh, it simplifies it. Yeah, I love it. I think that's an excellent way to... To, to think about things and I have a new way of looking at life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm all about the shortcut. I'm all about easy because I don't think things need to be hard, right? Mm -hmm. So whether I'm designing a color course for my, my painting clients, which is just launching online right now. So I'm super excited about it. I've got a great team behind me. Super simple, three steps. You're going to figure out how to pick the color you love in your home and then you don't need me anymore. Right. So what, so with my, my part course, it is an eight week course and it's going to give you the skills and you won't need me anymore. You can carry on with your life. You can start making the choices that lead you to a freedom state by acknowledging your worthiness. So whether it's that or whether it's that deathbed analysis, mm. it doesn't matter. So what I encourage people to, and these might not work for everybody, uh, but I encourage people to find that yes and no solution. Am I feeling good about this when I'm dying? Yes or no. There is no, well, maybe let me live another week and I'll let you know. No, you're either going to feel good or you're not. And so it is, um, it's easy, easy. I like yes, no answers. Yeah, I do too. It, it does really make things a whole lot simpler. And, yeah. you know, and, and I think when you come up with those yes or no answers, you're going to feel it in your gut. Absolutely. It is a knee jerk. You feel it like, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you can tell yourself stories around it and go, yeah, but this one, you know, it's going to make my neighbor happy. Who gives a shit about your neighbor? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Can I say that? Sorry. You said um, it. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> years of working in the trades and Ooh. criminals and all that. I have a bit of a trucker mouth, so I try to keep it in check. I um, have said something a couple of times and I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Because it's uh how do you rate your show when one slips out? Uh, <laughs> We're <yeah>. cool. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I apologize. I have a, a cup that says, I know I swear a lot. Uh, um, I try. It's a reminder to not. I, I love it. I mean, At least when I'm on somebody else's show. The rest of my life, I don't care. But, um, but hey, it, you know, <laughs> uh, it is so... Um, once we start understanding our methods for telling ourselves stories, right? Because if I am like, this is a yes and this is a no. And then I look at the no and I'm like, oh, it could be a maybe. Maybe it should be a yes. I am creating a story and a misalignment around that because I'm talking myself into it. So if I have to talk myself into something, it's not the right choice. So if you have a retail store and you got to talk yourself into buying something, to hold in your store, it's probably not great. If you see something, you're like, yes, that's it. That's what I want to sell. That is a way better reaction than, oh, Susie down the street's doing it. I should do it. No, if Susie's down the street's doing it, you definitely should not do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I'm just thinking, you know, for a lot of times they'll say, oh, don't jump into people. We'll say, don't jump into making decisions and don't. But, you know, if, if I'm faced with, should I do this or should I not do this? And my immediate response is, it, it, if we're not talking something legal versus illegal and that, but, you know, if you're just making, just trying to make a decision <laughs> on something, yes. you know, um, if your first reaction is yes, then go with that. Don't go back and say, well, do I really have the money? Right. Do I, do I this, do I that? There's a piece of software that I 
really want to buy. And I'm back and forth in myself right now. Well, do I really need it? Is it going to help? You know, and, and I go, damn it, just buy it. <laughs> you know? sure. Well, and you know, I do think that like, I believe everything is a double edged sword. I say that all the time. I don't care if it's deciding whether or not you buy software, there is a good side and a negative side to that. And I think it's really important to understand both sides. So while I think it is really important to see where your natural inclination leads, uh, mm. does it lean this way or does it lean that way is important. I think it's also important to understand that emotions are not always right. True. And so I believe that if I'm like, yes, I want to do that, I still have to check in with myself and go, okay, why do I want to do it? Do I want to do it because it's safer than the other option mm -hmm. and I'm scared? So I'm going to stay with something that's more comfortable. Do I want to do something simply because I like shopping and damn it, I need another pair of shoes <laughs> and these ones are just so cute. I might wear them twice this year. Like, do you know, it's that, um, so it's important, I think, to be able to have questions that we ask ourselves in the decision-making process. So when I see a pair of shoes, I'm like, do I, yes, I love them. Do I need them? How often will I wear them? Do I love them a hundred dollars worth or whatever the price tag is on them? 20, even if it's $20, do I love these shoes? $20. Do I love them $5? And if I love them $5, but they cost $25, I'm not buying them because to me, they're only worth $5, even though I really think they're cute, but they're not worth more than $5 in the scope of my year or whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. it's important that we have these questions that check our feelings. So great that we follow our intuition and there's another side to it as well. It's I've seen so many business owners just get really, yes, I want to do this. And yes, it should go here without thinking, Oh yeah. yeah, I'm opening a restaurant and 17 restaurants failed in that location. Yeah. You're abs. You're absolutely right. It, mm -hmm. it, you know, you can't, while I do still think it's important to, yes. you know, just to, to, to say my gut tells me this is the right thing. I think you're absolutely right that along with that, for me at least, along with that gut feeling, yes, it's right, does come, it makes sense. It's it's doable. It's something I should, you know, I, I don't like hurting anybody's feelings. Yeah. And I never want to tell anybody no. I never want, you know, to, to upset the apple cart. But go back to this to this uh, producer for the podcasts. Mm -hmm. I was at the end of my year's contract. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I did not want to sign another year's contract. Mm -hmm. But it's it's like, is it just because I don't want to pay that much money? Is she doing, you know, is she doing everything she promised me? Is she getting me everything that I need to grow my business? You know, do I just want to not tell her no because I'm hurting her feelings? You know, those are all things that go into get rid of her. <laughs> Yes. Well, and business is not always about an emotional response, right? Right. Like there has to be good business decisions that are based on business as well. Right. Uh, although I also subscribe that business is personal until it goes sideways and then it becomes business. Right. Mm -hmm. So there, mm -hmm. like I do have this, like it's, it's a spectrum. Here is this gut reaction. Yeah, let's do it. And here is paralysis by analysis right? And everything sort of falls in between there. But if I'm going to buy a tool for my business, say I need another ladder, say I need a 40 foot ladder and I have one. I, do I need a second one? How many times am I going to use a second one? Sure. It's fun to go out and buy new tools, but should I just rent it for this particular job? Yeah. What is the best business decision? And I've had to make business decisions that go against my gut reaction because it's a good business decision. Mm -hmm. It's still Absolutely. in alignment, uh, mm -hmm. but it was scary or it wasn't sexy or it was something that was me not getting really excited about. Um, in fact, maybe even rejecting off the cuff, but turned out to be a really great business decision. Yeah. So well, I've, I've like, got a, yeah, I've got an excellent example of that. And it's one that I went through and it's everybody out there is talking about using Infusionsoft. 
Yep. You know, you've got to have infusion soft. So I'm sitting there talking to my VA about it, and we're using MailChimp, and we've got all these funnels set up. We've got all of this stuff going through MailChimp. Doesn't cost us a penny to use MailChimp, and it's doing everything that I want it to do at this particular moment in time. But because everybody out there is saying, oh, you got to have Infusionsoft, I'm going, should we get it? And, you know, you I, I be the only person without infusion self P. Your friends will look down at you at the park. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, do, but then when I found out how much it costs, I went, oh, hell no, I don't need infusion <laughs> And there are people who do need it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's the important part of understanding what is it that you need for your business being super clear. If you're not the person that needs to have like a thousand dollar program, don't get the thousand dollar program. Your business yeah. will be fine. Often we spend so much time and money keeping up with the Joneses that we're shooting yeah. ourselves in the foot. Yeah. And I may at some point in the future, please God, you know, I may get to the point where I am going to need it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, no. that's how I was with ClickFunnels. Mm -hmm. I started it a couple of years ago with Domino Thinking, and then I it, it just didn't make sense. Like, it was an expense that I didn't need, but I was working with a coach who was like, you have to have it. And I'm like, I don't know anything about this. They do. I should believe them. Mm -hmm. I should believe them. And uh, so, but now... Oh, we have click funnels because it makes sense. I need yeah. it now for my business, right? With the courses yeah. and the games and all of that stuff. So um, it is, but I'm also using it for two other businesses as well. So it, that makes sense. It makes more sense to manage it all on one platform. It makes sense for my assistant, all of that. But that had to be a decision making because the first time it was an emotional decision. I don't know. So let's go with what this guy says. Yeah. Uh, yeah. because I didn't want to argue about something I knew nothing about. And so I deferred to his judgment. And yeah. sometimes that wins us and sometimes it loses us. So yeah. it's a, it's a, an experience, right? And we have mm -hmm. to have those experiences. Yeah. You can't like, we're going back to the learning again. You know, you can't, yeah. if you don't make decisions, you don't learn and you're never going to get, farther along the path you have yeah. to do things and i think that brings me to my next question it's a that's a perfect segue into this and that's what do you think is missing in most businesses um i think it's that piece i talked about earlier like why are you doing what you're doing why are you in this business instead of that business i think that is the biggest piece that's missing because without that i think a lot of businesses feel disconnected between their message or their platform or their um, policies or whatever the case may be. Um, I have, with my painting company, I have a policy for a warranty that if you're reasonable about a complaint, I am reasonable about fixing it. So if in two years you're like, this section doesn't look good, can you come and have a look? I don't know what's going on. I will happily come up, have a look and I will happily fix it if I can. If it's a construction thing, then I can't do it. But if it's a paint thing, I'm happy to fix it. If you contact me in 10 years and say, my paint's faded, I'm going to say, would you like another quote? Right? Mm. <laughs> uh, so I can have those policies that are in line with what's of a value to me. But if I don't know what my values are, right. how do I infuse that into my business and stay true? So I am more likely to waver if I don't know. I'm more likely to turn in an estimate to somebody the way they want it instead of the way I want it. Um, because I know my way works for me and is aligned with what I need. So I think most business, not most, a lot of, I, yeah, maybe most businesses, I don't understand why they're in business. And as a consumer, I like to understand. Because that can go in all of your marketing. Right. There is a great, um, I don't know if it's a, no, I don't think it's a TEDx. Um, but you know how Simon Sinek talks about start with why mm -hmm. he touches on that about, because it's what I believe, right? I believe that A, B, C, and D there is a guy who took it one step further and he's giving a talk on just including, I believe statements on your website. Ooh. Right. And yeah. so, and it, because, so I can say, I believe in giving value. I believe um, 
customers are not always right. I believe that uh, I can make a difference in the world. I believe tequila should be expensive. I can include all of this stuff. When people now see me, they get a sense of who I am because they understand what I believe in. I love, and I got goosebumps over that. I love it. <laughs> it is amazing. I will try to find you the link. Um, and if it's, I think it's just a YouTube one. Okay. Yeah, I will um, get that to yeah. me. I would love that. And I will share it with the audience at a later date when we have it, because I think that that's, oh, I did. I just really got goosebumps. I think that's, you know, incredible. <laughs> I really do. I think that's great. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it really changed an awful lot of things with me because it forced me to get clear on what I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I had it floating on my website for a while and then other things took over, but I know what I believe. So there's a twofold to it, right? By doing the exercise, I can tell my clients what I believe and uh, I get really clear on what I believe so it can permeate everything I do. That's great. We have been talking so much and I could just go on talking for hours and hours, but I want... <laughs> I would love for you to tell me a little bit about your book, Think Opposite. I want to know more about that. Oh, yes. I pulled it over the, <laughs> off my shelf while you were giving my extremely long bio. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, it, um, it was a really cool experience. I deal with the four pillars. I deal with who you are in your business, your customers. Like, how do you communicate with your customers? How do you value your customers? So many businesses see customers as an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. um, no, we have to change mm -hmm. that thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can understand our customers, then it just makes that relationship better. And if our customers can understand us, so it's building that relationship. The next thing it talks about is our staff. If we can understand why we are in business, we can start doing work around why does our, do our staff work for us and not somebody else? Like there is a fundamental difference between somebody who is going to work at Krispy Kremes or Tim Hortons as opposed to somebody who's going to work at Starbucks, mm -hmm. right? And so even though they're both serving coffee and sweets, it is a different environment. It's attracting different people. So when we understand that, we understand why our staff have gravitated towards us and not our competition. And that is key because we can understand how they value us or what we're offering. One, they can do that because they we are clear on what we want. Um, but now we can help them understand why they're doing it and where their place in life is. And I think as employers, it's our responsibility to help our employees with that stuff or make it available to them. And then the fourth part of the book is about our community. Ooh, and wow. how do we uh, give back to our community in a way that is meaningful? And that ties back to... Uh, what's important. So I think the example I give in my book, I'm pretty sure I have it in this book, is um, if I go into my doctor's office and she is raising money for a ballet school, I'd be like, I don't get it. And it breaks down trust because yeah. I don't get it. Like, why is she asking me to support dance? <laughs> if she um, is doing a fundraiser for Granny Go-Go's, helping grandmothers here support grandmothers in Africa, that makes a lot of sense to me. She is a grandmother. She is a doctor. So she make, she's female. So there's all of this connection. I'm like, oh, I get what she's trying to do here. I will support you. Um, our message going out there is so important. If she's raising money for dance and provides a story saying, hey, I was a ballerina before my car accident. After my car accident, I could no longer dance. I became a doctor because of A, B, C, and D, because of what great care I got when I was in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, but dance has always been really close to my heart, and I want to support other people doing it. Oh, now I get it, right? And so it's how do we communicate what we are supporting to our customers, our staff, and our community? Absolutely. I agree with that. And part of what I try to do every year through my business is to pick generally a local mm -hmm. business to support. Now, it may be, and there's, you know, I love pets. I My parents both died of dementia. My family and my husband's family have had many, many cases of cancer. You know, so all of those are different 
types of things that we support. We try to do it from a local standpoint, but I get you, you know, I, you know, if I'm just collecting money for the American Cancer Association, that's okay. But when you realize that my father had cancer twice, my husband's mother and sister died of cancer, my cousin died of cancer, I want this ending now that makes more sense yeah yeah I love for it. sure I love it yeah I want a copy of your book where do I get it <laughs> <laughs> uh, well there's two ways you can get it one um, well, and I guess both ways. If you want an actual hard copy, um, you can buy it off my website, dominothinking.com. Okay. Okay. And if you want an audio book, if you want to email my assistant at info at dominothinking.com, she will send you a free audio version. Oh, cool. If you want to listen to my voice for, you know, four hours or however long the book is running for. If I buy a hard copy, can I get it autographed? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful you got a deal <laughs> well, and you know it, it you know it comes back to sort of doing what's important like these fundamental principles about business is really important to me at the end of every book I have a domino thinking section where I ask people to think because asking people to think is really important to me as well so I had somebody read my book and said she was in business and she's like yeah it was a good business book she goes but what I really understood was how to talk to my son better because he is a domino thinking. I'm a thinker. I am a linear thinker. She goes, I could never understand the way he thinks. And so now she said, by reading your book, I'm a better parent. And I'm like, what? Wow. So, you know, it's crazy. I'm not saying this is a parenting book like that's, um, yeah. but we never know what we put out where it's going to land. And that is the importance of understanding what we believe in. How are we communicating it? Um, because people will take what they need from that. Well, and I think that's a good business lesson, just in and of itself. Everything that we do, you know, somebody may not get what we're saying, but they may get something else out of it. And yeah. I, I think that's an excellent, excellent example. Mm -hmm. Allison, we are about out of time. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you you know, just have to share with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what's burning on my table or desk all the time right now is the hashtag my part movement. I am working on, uh, on creating uh, in the world. And it's that accountability piece. It's understanding the choices that we make, how we co-create our life. And it starts with understanding our worthiness and reclaiming our worthiness. And I really want listeners to understand that you are worthy. Uh, you were born worthy. You were a miracle. This little tiny sperm found this little tiny egg in this bizarre act of sex and made you, not the thousand other options it could have made, it made you, which makes you a miracle. Mm -hmm. And when you understand that you are a miracle, you understand that you have inherent worth. And when you understand that you have inherent worth, you get to live off of that platform as opposed to trying to get your worthiness from somebody else which can put you into a victim state because you're always at the mercy of somebody else telling you you're good enough instead of knowing it inside yourself. So know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a miracle and you are worthy. I love it. That is a perfect way to end this conversation. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Give us again your website so that people know how to get a hold of you. Yes, it's dominothinking.com. Okay. Yes. And people, please listen and you can subscribe to this podcast and all of the other wonderful ones that we do. You can hear them live on Thursday evenings at 5 p.m. Eastern. And we always have fascinating, fantastic discussions with business owners. And so I look forward to talking to you all again soon. If you have any questions or thoughts on who you'd like to hear from or what you'd like to talk about, put them in the comments and let me know. And we will have a great conversation again next week. Until then, I hope you are productive, successful, and soar higher. Take care, y'all. Bye-bye.